Hi, I'm Jane M. Mason from Watching Paint Dry LLC. And today we're painting in this beautiful scene in northern Minnesota. And the sky is clear blue. There's a breeze in the air and it gusts. So I've got my palette taped down so it doesn't blow at me or blow at you. And I'll hang on to my hat. And But we can hear the crickets. We can hear some traffic. We can hear the rhythmic clanging as the wind is hitting chains against boat lifts. There's some people that are picnicking across the lake. It's a beautiful scene. This is one of the wonderful reasons why it's fun to paint outside. You get to absorb all this. Today it's a serene energy. It's quite beautiful. So as we look out at the scene and considering what we're going to compose, Sometimes it's tricky painting water. Water has so many elements to it. It has a surface area, it has a depth, it has colors of its own, it has the reflection from things around it, depends on where the sun is. So we're gonna think about what is the scene that we wanna convey. And this afternoon I'm gonna be doing a horizontal scene and I wanna convey the beauty of these brushes and reeds kind of moving back and forth, the water moving to the left, a little bit, we can see a tiny bit of a dock going out into the water. So the serenity of the greens and the blue, that's what we're gonna to convey today. I also wanna think about, in the foreground, I have some wildflowers. I also have these beautiful, I think they're wild, wild rushes or wild, uh, maybe just weeds. But as I look at them, they're not all vertical. Some of them are forming, I'll call them like a globe. So all the stems are seeming to come from a clump in the center and then moving out. So even things as simple as wild weeds, you need to take a moment and think, what is it about them that conveys their nature? And the nature of these particular weeds is that they come out from the center, spring out, they have this really lovely bouncy dance to them. But how are we gonna think about conveying the movement so that as the viewer is looking at the painting, they can still get some of the energy. So those are the things that we're contemplating. There's a young willow tree against the bank and I can see its branches are moving gently in the wind. So those are the kinds of things that we're thinking about. Even the differences in the vegetation. What are the shapes of the leaves, the branches and the reeds? What is the actual color of that part that enters the ground? So it pays to take a few moments to look over your scene and to think, what are the colors I want to think about? What's the scene I want to think about? So what I'm going to be looking at is including some of the foreground, including a swath of the lake through the middle. There's a lot of beautiful pines across the lake, very, very vertical. They don't have the same horizontal nature as this, I think it's a spruce, I'm not sure, it might be, I think it's a spruce. But these jack pines are much taller and they have the greenery at the top. And there might be an eagle nest in one of these. So there's beautiful things to observe. So it's not just about the painting. Part of it's just about thinking about what we're gonna paint and how we're gonna paint it. We're starting today with a new arches pad. But arches is a go-to paper for me. Frequently I paint with what is called a cold press or a rough paper, and it has a lot of surface to it. This happens to be a hot press, and it's very flat. And the reason you can remember the difference is hot press reminds you of an iron, a hot iron, so the surface is very flat. This is a new block, and as we've mentioned before, a block means that the pages have been glued on the edges. So as I open this block, it starts with a black sheet of paper. This black sheet of paper, it's glued, but there's a little opening here where it's not glued. So you stick a palette knife or a, sometimes I use an offset spreader like you'd use for frosting. You want something that's thin and flat, something that's not gonna mar the surface of the paper. So I might take this edge of this brush. Sometimes this works pretty well, sometimes not as well. Stick it in here and just start to glide it across and it will release the paper. There we go. This one's coming off pretty easily. And then this final edge, I think I can just 
yeah, I can just tear this vinyl edge off. I'll put this down. And as you can see, it gives us a big pad of paper. There's probably, I don't know, 15 sheets. Let me check what it says. I think about 15 sheets, 20 sheets, 20 sheets on this pad. The nice thing about using a pad is that it'll keep it flat for you while you are painting. You can use an easel, and sometimes I use uh, just a hard board to paint on, but there's a convenience in using a pad. The pads are a little bit more expensive, but um, sometimes the convenience is working worth it, particularly if you're painting on plein air or outside, because then in a breeze like this, I don't have to worry about the edges of the paper flapping toward me. It's one less thing to worry about. I think I'll have a lot of things flapping toward me, so I won't have to worry about the paper. I'm gonna turn it so my box here is helping to keep this from flapping. Now, as I look out and to my scene, on this particular painting, I'm gonna use a graphite pencil, and I want a hard pencil that's not gonna leave a lot of ed lead on the paper. If I leave a lot of lead, if I try to erase it, it makes a very unattractive smudge. So this is a hard leaded pencil, and I'll be able to sketch with that. Now, to start my sketch, I'm thinking about my proportion. And whenever you're composing a painting, you don't want to have your main focal point exactly in the middle. It's boring to the eye. You usually think about dividing a paper horizontally into thirds. Some people call it, it's like a golden ratio, where like a seashell or a, um, uh, even a, the uh, uh, Fibonacci series, these are all based on the same ratio. So if I were to divide my paper like this, I know this is the center. So I will avoid making a focal point here. If I think about a third and a third and a third and a third, I'm thinking this bottom third is going to be approximately where I'm going to have the dock and the water's edge. So I'm going to very gently for now, just barely to suggest for me, this is the where I'm going to put the dock. And the dock is horizontal. I don't want it too prominent. I think that's about right. I'll have the, there's a bank here, kind of a sandy bank. I'll have a sandy bank, and I'm just gonna suggest where the edge of the grasses are gonna go. I think the edge of the lake will be about here. On the other side of the lake, there's not a sandy beach like here, but there's a little bit of a hill that's a grassy hill. I'm going to add that. That might be a little too tall. I'm going to add that grassy hill. There's a house there on the other side of the lake. It's too dominant for me for this painting. So I'm going to move it out of the center of the painting and minimize it. Wow, it has a really long roof line. I see now it's almost more like a barn. Very unusual roof shape. There might be more detail happening in the roof that I can't quite see because of the trees. Um, it might have more layers, but I'm just going to draw it as I see it. Okay, I have the suggestion of the little house in there, or barn, or whatever that building is. And I'm happy with that size. It's not gonna dominate the painting. The trees, I think, 
They might even go off the painting. The trees are very tall. It's easier for me to draw a horizontal line than it is a vertical line. So often when I'm doing something horizontal, I will just turn my paper sideways. Again, I'm just suggesting trees. I don't want to put too many unnecessary lines in here. Some of these trees are going to be in front of this building. Some of these trees are going to be behind this building. It's very forested over there. So the main things we're going to be thinking and talking about will be the trees on that side. I kind of like the verticality of what's happening here. I think on this particular painting I'm going to go straight to the edges. Sometimes I stop before the edges. Sometimes I draw my own little frame. Sometimes I tape it off. On this one I think I'm going to go pretty much to the edges. So when it's framed it'll be matted and the painting will go behind the uh, mat. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my composition. There's a void over here. There happens to be a very young, not sure what this tree is, but a very young tree here, which would go, which does make a lot of sense. I could add this tree here. It's a little too far to the left, to the right, excuse me. I could add this tree. Here would be better. So my inclination, as you can see, is this is about a third in, a third, a third, a third. And my inclination is to put this right at the third line. And I think that's good. I'm not going to paint, I'm not going to draw it in too much. I'll know what that is. And it's very light. So when I, generally we paint from the light to the dark. But occasionally when you have something very light, you can go back and add yellow to it and it'll stand on top. So that tree has a lot of very light green and yellow in it. So that's what we'll use to have it make sure it stands on top. The other thing, there's still kind of a void here. So I'm going to take, there's some beautiful big boulders around. And I'm going to take some of these big boulders and I'm gathering them from all over the yard. But I'm going to clump them together. I want to make sure this area is interesting. As the artist, I want to tell you where I want you to visually enter the painting, visually, and I want to help you have your eye move around the painting in a circle. I want to create edges that lock your eye into the center. I don't want something that's going to shoot your eye off and have you look at something else. I want you to stay with my painting as long as possible. So my rocks, even the arrangement of my rocks, and this one's a tall vertical rock, and it has kind of a rounded surface. When you think about rocks, they can be daunting, but if you think about them as shapes, so you can see I'm making this one sort of like a bread box. So if you think about your shapes of your rocks as geometric three-dimensional shapes, it helps you imagine them with a mass and with the forms that you need to make them look like they are protruding in the space and not just lying flat on the space. So this other one is a lot smaller and really interesting. It's um, much bumpier. It has a side that's sort of been sheared off, which makes sense. Rocks can be very flat on one edge. But now I see these two shapes are mimicking each other. I don't care for that. So I'm going to make this one rounder and not so, not, I'm going to take this line out. In a minute, I'll take that line out. Um, so this rock, um, I kind of like that shape. It has some natural coloration in it. This side's quite dark. I'm going to take one of these other rocks from behind me and also place it here. This is a very flat rock, which I love. The owners of the property here, who let us paint here, which is nice, said they had their landscapers place these rocks around so that the butterflies could come and warm themselves. Up here in Minnesota, it gets really cold. So the butterflies have a chance to sit on the warm rocks and fan their wings, and the warmth of the rock helps warm them up. It was pretty cold this morning, so all of us kind of thought, yeah, maybe we'd spend a little bit of time sitting on these rocks, fanning our wings, warming up. Okay, I'm making this again so it has a three-dimensional nature to it. The owners here too like to plant a 
a lot of milkweed. Milkweed is the plant that monarch butterflies like. The monarch butterflies really come through Minnesota. So if you can create a habitat that works for the monarchs, it's good for everyone because, boy, those are beautiful butterflies, aren't they? Okay, I'm happy with my rocks. I'm going to need to change these two because they're too similar. I can do that with an eraser in a few minutes. So I have my dock here. I'll probably change my dock a little bit. And uh, I will then think about how I'm going to introduce the water, too. But I'm just about done with my drawing. So we're going to start painting. And I think I feel like doing a lot of layering today. Since this is a hot press paper, so it has a very smooth surface, I'm going to leave the paper quite flat while we're painting today. So there'll be a lot of layers, but there'll be light layers. I'm going to start with a little bit of a wash through the center where the water is going to be, and it'll help me think about the sky. I won't have much room for sky because the trees are so high, but I will have some sky holes, and I'll show you how that's going to work. So it's going to be a little bit more difficult to see where my water is because it's so bright out here today. Luckily my water is not 100% clean, so I can kind of tell because it has a little tiny bit of color in it right now anyway. I'm going to take, um, also going to put a little water up here where I might put some sky holes. Not too much. And as you can tell, sometimes I completely saturate the paper. You can see this is a much more gentle touch. So I'm not saturating the paper. I'm just giving it a little water so I'll have some movement. This is a wet on wet technique. And as you know, I use a wet on wet technique quite a bit. OK, I've mixed a blue color. That's a combination of some cerulean, some cobalt, and a little bit of Windsor blue. The Windsor blue is a Windsor Newton color. There's also cheap, uh, cheap Joe's has a blue called Joe's Blue. It's also known as the Thalo Blue. Sometimes the blues that have the same brand name as the manufacturer, that's their Thalo Blue. So I'm just going to add a little bit of uh, light to the water here. Very uh, irregular pattern with my brush strokes. A little bit more bouncy too, so that I have some kind of natural movement happening here. Uh, I'm not sure if you can tell already, but the paper is quite different, and so it's except this, this hot press paper, so it's accepting the water differently. I'm now going to go up and just in a few places put what we consider sky holes, where in the trees there'll be a little bit of sky coming through here and there. This, the part of the, brush, the sponge I'm using right now is completely dry. I'm just going to use it to feather out some of these edges and to make the little sky holes seem more cloud-like, more random. Than, and I don't like any sharp edges on them. So where there might be a tendency to have a sharp edge, I'm just taking this dry sponge and moving the edges around. You can see how the water has dried a little bit here. I'm also going to move these out so I don't have hard edges here. And it gives the illusion of the reflected clouds in the water. I might have a couple of other sky holes over here. Again, I'll take my sponge to even them out. Sometimes I have tremendous amount of energy and want to instill that into my painting, and so there might be much more color. As I mentioned in this particular painting, I have a very even, serene, relaxed, calm energy, and that's what I want to be conveying in this particular painting. Mm -hmm.